But the number one barrier that I remove, that I hear over and over again, it's in different forms, is I am not CISO material or no one will hire me as a CISO. Basically, this is unsolvable. You're basically telling your brain, I cannot be a CISO, but you want to be, and that's creating internal struggle. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, 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 welcome. Hopefully, you know what time it is. It's time for Life of a CISO with yours truly, Dr. E is in the house. It's always a pleasure, always thrilled to be with you, always thrilled to spend some time with you. It's funny, I wish I thought it out a little more because I don't know if I want my tagline of how I'm known is to be welcome, 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 but that seems to be what it is, right? I I, I walk up to people, uh, sometimes even at airports, they'll come up to me or uh, new client calls that listen uh, to this podcast and they're like, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm like, oh, here we go. Right? So it's awesome. So so maybe I should have thought it out, but you know something? I guess there could be worse things uh, to be known for than welcome, 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 welcome. So I'll take it. Uh, and as always, welcome. We're here to talk about how to be world-class. How do you be one of the best in the world at what you do? And it's funny because I had somebody ask me a week or so ago, about Eric, why are you obsessed with world class? And, and it threw me for a second because I'm sort of like, what do you mean? It's like just part of my DNA. They're like, but, but why are you so obsessed with it? Why can't people just be good at something or average? And I thought about it and it's simple. Why are you going to do something if you're not gonna give 100%? Why do you wanna do something if you don't wanna be the best? Right? That just doesn't make sense to me, right? It's not, it's not how I'm wired or program. It's like going in and saying, you know something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this sport or I'm going to do this competition and, and I'm a, I, I want to come in 10th. No, I want to come in first. Now, I also recognize the reality, right? I used to, I, I love fitness and I switch it up. I used to do Ironman competitions. And, and yes, w w when I went to Kona uh, the one year I qualified, I'm like, I want to win. Now, I didn't win. And the probability of me winning was pretty thin. But imagine my mindset, what it would have been like if I said, yeah, I because I, I've had some people, I just want to survive the race. That sounds awful. <laughs> I mean, what does survive the race mean? You don't die? I mean, that's a pretty low bar of success. So as long as I cross the finish line and I don't die, then I, I'm going to be happy. I mean, I'm happy anyway, right? But, but my goal, though, I want to win. Right? I'm going to train as if I'm going to win. I'm not going to half you know what it, right? I, I, I try not to curse on these. So I'm not going to half butt it, right, or anything like that. So, so why not give 100%? I mean, if you're going to do something, go all in, right? Give 100%. If you're going to start exercising, go all in. If you're going to start reading, go all in, right? Why do something if you're not going to give everything you got to try to be the best? And what I love about this is there are some of you right now that have stopped listening. And I'll be honest with you. Thank, thank you. Because you're the ones that are going to criticize me the whole time because you don't get it, right? But those of you that are still here, you get it, right? You're like, yeah, yeah, right? You, you understand and you think like me and, that, and that's okay, right? I recognize that I'm not going to be the right thing for everyone. There's going to be some people that don't get me and that's okay. But the reason I'm doing this is because there's you, right? There are some people that do get and understand what I'm saying, that if you're going to do something, go all in. And you know I love with my stories, 
And I always say this is my favorite story. And people joke, go, dude, every story is your favorite story. Yeah, I guess I could say story and you just know all my stories are favorite. And I always, just so we're clear, I've learned my lesson. I'm always going to say the stories are fictional. Even though they are based on factual data. Here's why I do that. Because otherwise, if I get something wrong, people are like, dude, you got it incorrect. So I'm like, I'd rather tell fictional stories based on factual events, and this way I can take poetic liberties if I get it wrong, right? But, but, but uh, this was based on facts. So there was a world-class physicist. When he was in college, he was taking an advanced theory class in physics. Very high level PA, I mean, super geeky type class. And he was running late one day and he shows up to class with five minutes left in class, right? Showed up really, really late and shows up the last five minutes and there's three problems written on the board. Well, this is the middle of the semester and the way this teacher teaches is they put the homework up during the class. So as the teacher teaches, he goes, okay, here's problem one for homework, problem two, problem three. So it's very, very customary that at the end of class, the questions that are on the board is the homework. So he was a little frazzled because he was late to class, this and that. He didn't bother to check with anybody. He saw the three problems. He wrote them down. And he said, that's the homework. And he went off. So that weekend, he started working on what he thought was the homework. And he noticed the problems were a little more difficult, right? They were a little trickier than previously before. He even looked them up in the book and he wasn't able to find any of them in the book. So it's like, okay, that's a little strange, but, but maybe it's halfway through the semester, teacher's cranking it up. So he focused on one problem and he applied all the theories that he knew and he spent the entire weekend solving the one problem. Because it took so long, he wasn't able to solve the other two. So he wasn't able to complete all the homework. He only completed one of the three questions on the homework. So when you're in graduate level working on your PhD, you have sort of a closer relationship with the professor. So he figured he'd swing by and just give the professor a heads up that he wasn't able to complete all the homework and to maybe ask for some advice. So he goes to the professor's office and he goes and he says, listen, I just want to let you know that I was only able to complete one of the homework because they seemed a lot harder than normal. And here it is. And I want to see if I can get some help on the other two. And the professor sort of gives him a weird look and starts flipping through the homework, the one problem, like getting this really like bizarre look on his face. And then he looks at the student and says, what did you think those three problems were that I wrote on the board? And he confessed, he told the teacher, listen, I showed up late. And I assumed that was the homework. And the teacher starts laughing and goes, you know what those three problems were? Those were the three most difficult, unsolvable problems in physics. Those were the three problems that for the last 30 years, no one was able to solve in physics. And he goes, the reason I'm laughing is I'm gonna have to spend more time, but looking at the mathematical proof here, I actually believe you solved one of the problems. Or if anything else, you made more significant contribution in a weekend on one of the unsolvable problems that anyone I've known, including myself, has done. He goes, so, so let me absorb this a little bit more, but I think you've accomplished a major, major breakthrough in physics, solving something that nobody ever thought was solvable. Now, what's the lesson here? Your brain is powerful. If your brain thinks something is solvable, it'll solve it. If it thinks it's unsolvable, it won't solve it. Now, I can almost guarantee that if that student showed up to class on time 
and knew that those three problems were unsolvable and that nobody, even the brightest minds, even the professor over the last 30 years have not been able to solve it? Do you really think first he would have even tried to solve it? No. Most people listen to other people. They listen to smarter people. They listen to professors. So if you're a student and your professor tells you this is unsolvable, you wouldn't even try. And if you did, you probably wouldn't succeed because guess what your mind's saying? It's unsolvable. It's unsolvable. The brightest minds can't solve it. What makes me think I could solve it? But what was the difference in this case? His mind thought it was homework. His mind thought it was a doable problem. And he basically approached it as this is a problem with a solution. Otherwise, the professor would not have given it to me. And therefore, I must solve it. Now, it took longer. It was harder. And it was difficult. But because they believed it was homework, they believed it must be complete to get a grade, and they believed it was solvable, they approached it completely different. Now, question. How many, and I'll use the word problems, challenges, issues, whatever word you want, in your life, you are not tackling because somewhere somebody told you they were unsolvable? Somewhere somebody told you that you had to deal with it, right? I hear this all the time where if I'm interviewing or working with folks or things like that, where somebody goes, oh, well, I was told by my parents that I have difficulty learning or the school when I was in elementary school said I had trouble reading. Who made them an authority and why in the world did you believe them? I, why? What, what if they instead told you that you had great reading abilities, that you had great abilities in learning something? And by the way, they've done these studies where they've taken students that technically have learning disabilities and they put them in two categories. One category... They outwardly told them, you have trouble reading. You have, you're going to have difficulty your entire life reading. And what do you think most of them had? Difficulty reading their entire life. They took another group, same exact students, and they told them, you're gifted in reading. You have a unique talent. These tests have said that you are one of the most gifted readers. And what do you think happened to most of those students? They became prolific readers. It's amazing how what we're told and what our mind believes dictates what we can do. It's the craziest thing on the planet. And it drives back to one of the quotes that I always tell myself. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right. Because if you tell yourself it's unsolvable, you're not going to be able to solve it. If you tell yourself it's solvable, you probably will. So I just challenge you. What if you started telling yourself that every problem was solvable? What if you told yourself that you were gifted and you can accomplish any task you put in front of you? What if you start changing how you view things? Instead of listening to what other people say that this is unsolvable, what if you say, yeah, I could solve it anyway, right? It's crazy, crazy when you really look at the power of the mind of what you decide dictates what you can do. It basically puts a governor on your life. Governors, as you know, control the speed of a car. Just because there's a governor on a car doesn't mean it can't go over 50. It just means it's not going to. Take the governors off your life. Start pushing yourself a little harder. You have a lot more capability than what you realize, and that goes back to world class. Stop playing small. Stop going good enough. Stop giving 10% and start being world class and make every problem in your life solvable, right? Awesome, awesome, awesome.
So always like starting up with a little bit of mindset world class because guess what? What I just went in and taught you, if you really get it and you understand it, is the biggest problem with all my coaching clients. When I go in and take coaching clients of people that want to be CISOs and haven't been able to, yeah, do, do I help them a little bit on business language and mindset? Yeah. Do I help them a little bit on strategy and components? A absolutely. Do, do, do I help them a little bit on those different areas? Yes. But the number one barrier that I remove, that I hear over and over again, it's in different forms, is I am not CISO material or no one will hire me as a CISO. Basically, this is unsolvable. You're basically telling your brain, I cannot be a CISO, but you want to be, and that's creating internal struggle. Once we remove that, once we go in and say you are CISO material, you can be hired, this is a solvable problem, everything changes for them. So that's the piece of why I spend so much time and half of my podcast on, because I always get pushback from some of my folks that listen to the podcast for the first time, and they're like, Eric, I thought it's life of a CISO. I'm like, it is. Well, I listened to 10 minutes and I stopped listening because you don't talk about anything involving a CISO. I said, dude, forest through the trees. <laughs> you just missed the whole point. The first 15 minutes is the most important. That's what's going to make you a world-class CISO. That's what's going to get you the job. It's a mindset problem. The technical components are easy. Now, the second half is based on request. I have gotten multiple requests to talk about expert witness and what an expert witness is and the expert witness business that I focus on. Let me give a little context. World-class people, world-class entrepreneurs, world-class professionals, and world-class CISOs have multiple sources of income. They might not tap them all at the same time. They might not utilize them all in parallel, but you have to and must have the ability to generate multiple sources of income, to generate revenue, to build businesses in different areas. Now, it's all around the same skill set. It's all around cybersecurity, technology, strategy, and leadership. But the question is, what are other areas where you can utilize this expertise? What are other areas where you can go in and help other people solve their problems? And one of those areas that I encourage you to potentially look at, it's a great growth area, is expert witness work. What expert witness is, is when two companies, it could be two entities, two individuals, but usually it's two companies, have a dispute where they believe that one of the companies did the other one wrong, and I'll give you details, but just at a high level, and one company sues another company, and they go to court. Well, these can often be very technical, right? If we're talking about theft of technical information or a data breach or things like that, that can be very, very technical. Now, at least I'm going to be a little biased to the U.S. here, but it applies to a lot of other countries also. So if you're in other countries, anyone that uses common law-based systems would be similar to this. But in the United States, you have a right to a jury of a, you have a right to a trial done by a jury of your peers. So you have a right to a jury trial. You could pick a bench trial, which is a judge makes the decision, but you have a right to a jury trial. This means you're gonna have a jury, depending on the case, of seven, nine, or 12 people that are randomly selected that are basically going to decide the outcome of the case. They're gonna all have different backgrounds, different experiences, different skill sets, but they need to understand the case at a high level 
in order to be able to make an appropriate ruling. Some of them might, but the probability of all of them having detailed training in cybersecurity or computer science is probably pretty low. So now you have a very technical problem in a technical area, and you have somebody that doesn't have technical training in that skill set that has to go in and make a decision. So how do you go in and bridge that gap? You bring in experts. Experts who actually can testify and give opinions that the jury can rely on in order to make an appropriate decision. Essentially, what is an expert witness? You, 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 this is so cool. You're going you're gonna to see all the dots connect. This is so cool. An expert witness is a translator. I'm basically taking very, very technical details and technical facts. I'm translating it to high level so somebody non-technical can understand what's happening and make an appropriate decision. Hmm. Doesn't that sound a lot like a CISO? It does. So if you're a master of translation where you can take technical facts and figures, technical data and technical issues and explain them in a non-technical way so somebody who doesn't have detailed training can understand, that's a world-class CISO and that's a expert witness. So they're almost an identical skill set. If you are good at one, you most likely will be good at the other because they're basically solving the exact same problem. So this is an area that if you're more entrepreneurial and you're starting a business on vCISO and you also want to have some other income sources, Expert witness could also be a nice area for you to look at. Also, you have to check with your company, but it could also be a nice alternative stream of income for you. Now, here's the other interesting part. Where are most experts today? So today, if you look at most technology cases, in computer science, cybersecurity, networking, operating systems, and related fields, where are most of the experts today? College professors. As you know, college professors, great job, but typically, depending on where they are in their career, they might be teaching two or three courses a semester as basically a full-time load. And then if they're a research professor, they might only be teaching one class, and then every few years they get a sabbatical. So college professors have some time, depending on the research, where they could potentially work on other things. So expert witness is a nice area for them to apply their skill sets of teaching, because right, they're teaching the technical matters, the students, so they're in a teaching mode, so that makes sense, and as a way to potentially augment their income. So most of the experts that I work with or work against, right, uh, or that I run across are usually college professors in those related areas. And that works great in one of the prime areas of IP. So, so, so let me deviate into one of the areas of expert witness. IP stands for intellectual property. Intellectual property, most of the time, when you're dealing with legal matters, has to deal with patents. Yeah, you could get into other areas, but, but mainly you have one company filed and was issued a patent. And once again, I'm giving the sort of high level, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not giving legal advice or legal definitions in any way, shape, or form here. I'm just giving general information. You should, of course, research any of this and not take it on face value. You can you tell I work with attorneys uh, on that front. So it's just giving you more friendly advice here. This is not legal advice in any way, shape or form. But essentially, a patent 
is where somebody goes in, files for a patent, and it details out an invention. And the whole idea behind patents is the government wanted to go in and aspire innovation. They want people to share ideas. But wait, if I share my idea, somebody could steal it. So the idea of a patent is I share the idea and I now am given exclusive protection of that idea for a period of time where nobody can use it without paying me a license. And then after a certain period, it then expires and anybody can use the technology. So the government basically says, we think this is a fair deal. If you share your innovation so somebody can actually reduce it to practice and implement it with the public, we'll give you an exclusive time period in which nobody can use it without licensing it from you. And after that, once the patent expires, anybody can use it and it helps uh, promote innovation within the country. So fair deal, or if you don't think it's a fair deal, that's unfortunate. That is what the Patent and Trademark Office does. That's the reality. So if a company has a patent that's active and valid and another company is infringing that patent and that company doesn't believe they infringe and doesn't want to pay a license, then you have a lawsuit where the owner of the patent, the plaintiff, sues the company, the potential infringer, and they go in and basically have to argue in court whether the company really infringes or not. And then if the company infringes, right, the jury will decide what the damages should be based on the amount of revenue that the products that infringe the product basically made over the period of infringement. So there needs to be an expert that can go in and basically talk about how the technology works and why the patent infringes. So let me explain the patent to you. Let me show you how the product works. And then let me show you how the product practices each and every element of the claim that we're saying infringes. And if you can do that, then you basically proved infringement. So that's where one of the big areas where college professors go in and can do a great job on the infringement side, but there's no reason you can't either. And I've been very, very successful on patent infringements and going in and working in those areas. However, there's another issue that comes up, which is called technical apportionment. So once somebody goes in and proves infringement, so we prove that it infringes, a uh, technical expert has to go in and determine what percent of the product the patent contributes to. Because it's often not 100%, right? You have this great product that's selling for $30,000 and it infringes, but that doesn't mean that the 100% of the product practices the patent. It might be 50, 60, or 70%. So you need to have a technical expert with industry experience to be able to talk about how that apportionment is done. And at least in my experience, that's an area that some, not all, right, I'm always careful here, that some college professors can't do as good a job in because they don't have that industry experience. They haven't actually done it for commercial organizations, which many of you have. Because if you're a CISO, you've probably evaluated technology. You've probably gone in and you might not have called it apportionment, right? But you've probably done that where if you're buying a company, selling a company, or licensing technology, which many CISOs are actively involved with, you're doing that apportionment without even realizing it. So by being a practicing network professional that's actively in the field doing this as a CISO, you now have a unique skill set where you can go in and be able to testify about how you've done technical apportionment historically in your career, how commercial companies are doing it, and then how you actually did apportionment in this particular case. That's one where it starts to make you unique because that's not something that traditional college professors have experience with 
because it requires real world experience working in cybersecurity and working with vendors. So that's just one area that I wanted to share that if you're looking at either diversifying, looking at a parallel path, building another business, or maybe either complementary or taking a break from CISO, expert witness might be an interesting area for you to pursue as a CISO because it's the same exact skill set. You have to take detailed technical problems and you have to explain them to a judge or jury and patent infringement and apportionment are two areas that fit very, very nicely into that skill set. So like I said, this is not something I normally bring up about alternate income streams, but I've had multiple people right, ask me again and again because they've seen some of the EW expert witness work that I've done just to say, hey, what is expert witness? How does it work? And what are the types of cases that you would work on? So I just wanted to share that information with you always looking to expand your knowledge and expertise. And as always, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Life of a CISO, and I look forward to seeing you next week and making you a world-class CISO.